As we observe the world events in the light of Bible prophecies, we realize that Europe is increasingly coming together as a dominant world superpower. We know that a strong united Europe will play a vital role in the events leading to the return of Jesus Christ, brethren. Today I want us to take a look at a certain aspect of a strong Europe to come. Speaking of this, the Bible uses a general term for Europe. And when we see that term in the Bible, we can know that it refers to Europe in a general way. The term I'm talking about is Babylon. In the Bible, the word Babylon means many things. And among other things, it applies to Europe in a general manner. And there are, of course, different aspects to Babylon, as we have been learning from Dr. Thiel's writings and teachings. In this message, I want us to understand a very important component to Babylon. In order to do that, we need to, first of all, look at the prophecy in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 23. And we're going to read verse 2. And then, of course, we're going to read verse 2 and a few other verses to understand that verse. Ezekiel 23 verse 2. Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. Now what is this talking about, brethren? Who are these two women? We find the answer in verse 4. Their names, Ohola, the elder, and Oholiba, her sister. They were mine, and they bore sons and daughters. As for their names, Samaria is Ohola, and Jerusalem is Oholiba. So now we know who they are and who is this prophecy referring to. We understand, I believe, that Samaria was the capital of the ten northern tribes of Israel, which separated from Jerusalem and formed their own kingdom. And Jerusalem remained the capital of Judea, south of Samaria, and has been known in the Bible of history as the kingdom of Judah. Let us back up to verse 3. They committed harlotry in Egypt. They committed harlotry in their youth. Their breasts were there embraced. Their virgin bosom was there pressed. Now this is what both houses of Israel, the ten tribes and Judah, did in Egypt. They transgressed God's law and were following their own ways. Now we see there is something peculiar about this verse, brethren. They committed spiritual harlotry in Egypt. What does this mean? We certainly know when they were in Egypt, they were not two nations. The house of Israel was one unified nation in Egypt. There was no kingdom of Israel comprised of the ten northern tribes and the kingdom of Judah comprised of Judah and Benjamin. All Israel in Egypt was one nation. So, the time Israel spent in Egypt, they spent it together and were not divided. They lived in Egypt several hundred years before they were divided into two nations. Therefore, we must understand that this is a prophecy and that this prophecy is for a future time. In fact, this is a dual prophecy. The first fulfillment of this prophecy occurred when they were staying in Egypt as one nation. This is literal. However, the second aspect of this prophecy is... Uh, that it will happen again in the future. So let us continue to read in verse 5. Ohola played the harlot even though she was mine, and she lusted for her lovers, the neighboring Assyrians. So Samaria, the kingdom of the ten northern tribes of Israel, was taken captive to Assyria in 721 before Christ. Let us drop to verse 11, which says, Now although her sister Oholiba saw this, she became more corrupt in her lust than she, and her, in her harlotry more corrupt than her sister's harlotry. Now this is referring to Judah and Benjamin. This is referring to the kingdom of Judah. Verse 22. Therefore, O Holiba, thus says the Lord, Behold, I'll stir up your lovers against you, from whom you have alienated yourself, and I'll bring them against you from every side. Well, brethren, kingdom of Judah was taken captive by the Babylonians 135 years after Samaria was taken captive and the ten tribes of Israel were taken away from their land. Now, those two captivities occurred because of the sins of the house of Israel at that time before Christ. However, brethren, these prophecies are dual. They were fulfilled once in the time before Christ and they were they were fulfilled on the ancient house of Israel in the 6th and 7th centuries before Christ. Now, there remains another fulfillment of these prophecies in our time, and they'll be fulfilled on the modern house of Israel 
because the sins in Egypt are also the sins in this world. Egypt is the world, brethren. I believe that we understand that Egypt is the type of the world. As we keep the Days of Unleavened Bread, we always, go, we always are reminded that we need to leave our spiritual Egypt. So, as true Christians, we must come out of the modern Egypt. Therefore, the sins of Ahola and Aholiba are the sins of the descendants of Israel and Judah in the world today. Therefore, Ezekiel prophesied of the captivity of Israel and Judah yet to occur. We have to be aware of this. Now, verse 23 and 24, there is something else very peculiar there. Verse 23, the Babylonians, all the Chaldeans, Pekod, Shoah, Koah, all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, governors and rulers, captains and men of renown, all of them riding on horses. Of course, horses are the symbols of uh, war machinery because Ezekiel couldn't really have, you know, he couldn't have idea, the idea about the modern weaponry that we understand is present today in our world. And they shall come against you with chariots, wagons, and war horses, with a horde of people. They shall array against you buckler, shield, and helmet all around. I will delegate judgment to them, and they shall judge you according to their judgments. Now, we notice again something very peculiar in these verses, brethren. The Babylonians and all the Assyrians with them. Now, in ancient time. In the 6th and 7th centuries before Christ, the captors were first the Assyrians and then 135 years later, it was the Babylonians. You know, there were two different captivities. Yet, verse 23 mentions Babylonians and Assyrians as being together. And this was not the case in those times before Christ. Those two forces, Assyrians and Babylonians, came separately to take the ten tribes and Judah away from their land. Then in verse 24 we read, And they shall come against you. They, who are they? The Babylonians and the Assyrians with them. You know, they shall come against you, against the modern house of Israel and the modern house of Judah. So this is talking about the future time, brethren. This is a future event. We need to understand that there are two main components of Europe today, or at least those of us who live in Europe will convey this to you, to those of you who don't live in Europe, and so that you can better understand what is going on right now as Europe is coming increasingly together. So, we need to explain, brethren, and we need to understand as God's people, there are two main components of Europe today. Both are mentioned in the Bible, of course. One is Babylon, and the other one is, as we have seen, Assyria. Now, Babylon in the Bible is this religious system, Babylon the Great. The second component of Europe today is the political one. It is Assyria, and it is also a military component, we might say, because Assyria, the modern Germany, is now pushing for the formation of European army. Now, you need to understand there are plenty of proofs, and uh, we have got literature about that, that the ancient Assyrians are actually the forefathers of the modern Germans and Austrians. So, that's one of the biblical truths that we need to understand, and if you don't have any clue about that you can request literature that can explain that to you very well and give you the uh, origin the ethnic origin and the history of the german people just prior to this sermon i've uh, i sent you brethren uh, that uh, thesis that was written about the german character now the german character stems you know and goes back is traced back to their ancestors the assyrians and to the uh, you know to the philosophy of the assyrian nation which was exactly the same as the Germans have been all the time and what they expressed in both world wars. So yes, there are prophecies about Assyria in the Bible, but they're dual as well, meaning that it's not now, when we read about Assyria in the Bible, it is not talking about the ancient Assyria. It is talking about the modern Assyria. It is talking about the Germans. We need to clear, be clear about, uh, about that, and we need to clear, have a clear understanding of that. It is very important. So, you know, our members in Serbia, they well remember how in the years past, I kept telling them that as soon as Great Britain leaves Europe, we were going to see how plans for European army would be unveiled. 
And sure enough, brethren, as soon as Brexit occurred, Germany pulled out of a drawer its plan for the future European army. So again, when Assyria is mentioned in the Bible, it usually is in regards to military and political power. The ancient Assyria was such a power. The modern Assyria, their descendants, the modern Assyria, Germany, is slowly climbing up the social ladder to become such a power. And it will be such a shock to the world, especially to the Anglo-Saxon world, when it discovers all of a sudden that Germany has become a world superpower. Now, right now, German economy is the strongest in Europe. And from what we can tell you here in Europe, European unification is actually centered around the German economic and political influence. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. I'm sure you know that there are two beasts mentioned there. Now, of course, the beasts are, again, symbolic language, and they symbolize the real things. In Revelation 13, we see that there are two different beasts. The first one is a political and military beast. This is, that is the political leader of the future United States of Europe, the coming European dictator. And the second beast is a religious one, and that one is Babylon, the ecumenical Catholic Church seated in Rome. And both beasts work hand in hand. In verse 11, Revelation 13, we read, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. I think I've explained this before, but if I haven't, brethren, let me repeat myself. If I haven't, let me explain it now, but if I have, let me repeat myself. Two horns. The horns are symbols of the authority. Now, there is one unique entity in our world, which is not only the church, but it's also the state at the same time. The state church, the only such entity, is Vatican. Vatican is at the same time, has ecclesiastical power, is the Catholic Church, but at the same time, it's also a political power. It is a state, the smallest state in the world. That is what is represented by these two horns. He speaks like a lamb. He speaks like, you know, speaks like Jesus Christ, quotes the Bible, quotes the, quotes the scriptures, uh, at least the New Testament scriptures, but of course spoke like a dragon. Why? Because all their doctrines are contrary to the Bible, contrary to Jesus Christ, and are actually the doctrines of the dragon, of the, uh, of the spiritual entity, which, spiritual being actually, Satan the devil, which inspires them to preach, because we know clearly who is, who is the dragon, that symbol of Satan the devil. So we know who dragon is, verse 12. And he exercises this second beast. He, obviously, it will be the head of that second beast, the head of that hierarchy, church, and, and, and state hierarchy. Of course, the Pope, whether the current one or some future Pope anyway. So he exercises all the authority of the first beast, of the European dictator in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. The deadly wound, as I explained probably before to you, is the wound of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was deadly wounded when it was divided into the Western and Eastern Roman Empire. And nowadays what we are seeing, well, we have seen this already in the history of Europe six times. Uh, there was this healing of this wound. There was this attempt, at least in the western part of the of European nations, to create holy, so-called Holy Roman Empire. So what we are seeing basically right now, we are seeing actually uh, the countries of the Western Europe and countries of the Eastern Europe, Bulgaria, Romania, and also the candidates for the European Union are the Western Balkan nations. We are seeing the uh, East and West of the ancient Roman Empire coming together into one European super state, which will most likely be called the United States of Europe. So that's the deadly wound, brethren, which is going to be healed. So that division between the Eastern, uh, historical Eastern and historical Western Roman Empire will no longer be there, and it will be one unified super state. The religious beast, however, the second one, is the power that makes the world, and mainly Europe, worship the political beast, the first, politi the first beast in Revelation 13, which is embodied in the coming European dictator. Now, there is a close cooperation between those two components of Europe, and there is a great harmony. That harmony, however, this chapter tells us, is not going to last, because something peculiar is going to happen. Uh, we read about this in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 16. 
In Revelation 17, 16, when it says that the political, the, the political beast will destroy the second beast, the religious beast. So this harmony between these two beasts is short-lived. It is a radical change from what we have read in chapter 13. Now, why is that going to happen? Well, we shall see it shortly as we analyze what is behind Assyria. We will see what is behind the modern Assyria, Germany. And to understand what is behind Germany, brethren, we need to examine what is the real thinking of Germans at large. What is the real philosophy of Germany? We also need to realize that this philosophy is not necessarily known except by the leaders. In other words, the majority of Germans at this point may not really be aware of this philosophy, which will be driving that nation to fulfill the prophecies of Ezekiel and other prophets in relation to the modern house of Israel. However, their leaders might be well aware of this, brethren, so don't be surprised. Now, common people, of course, don't know everything. As we all know, the people are used to implement such and such ideas and philosophies as directed by their leaders. But on the whole, they don't know what is going on. And I'm going to read to you some amazing things today. Those amazing things, brethren, come from a book written in French. Sadly, that valuable book has never been translated into English and most likely it has never been translated into other languages. It surely has not been translated into Serbian, which is pity because the Serbian nation suffered uh, by Germany uh, a couple of genocides. Both of them occurred in the last century. And interestingly enough, one would think that, you know, when such a valuable book, Hitler and the Black Order, appears in French, some would think that, you know, a country which was a great victim of Hitler's regime should have uh, paid attention, should have obtained the book, should have obtained the copyright for Serbian language and should have translated it into Serbian. Unfortunately, that book that I'll be quoting from today has not been translated into Serbian language nor into English language. But before we go any further, brethren, let us notice again that the two beasts of Revelation 13 the religious one and the political one and military one are inspired by Satan himself. Surely we know Satan's influence on Babylon the Great, the established Christian church, because, you know, we all had to come out of such a false Christian religious system. And there is a book entitled The Two Babylons, written, which is available in English, and it is written by Alexander Hislop. It is very interesting, brethren, an informative piece of work. And uh, it is, you can freely download it from internet if you don't want to buy it. So, you know, I would highly recommend that you read it because it's uh, quite a revelation and quite an amazing piece of work. And we will see how in that book you can see how the, uh, the parallels between the ancient Babylon ruled by Nimrod and Semiramis and also the modern Babylon, the modern Catholic uh, religious system ruled by the papacy. So we understand Satan's influence on the religious beast. But how well do we know Satan's influence on the political beast, on the first beast in Revelation 13. So therefore we need to see Satan's influence on the Assyrian philosophy, that is on the Germanic philosophy. Isaiah chapter 10 is a very important chapter concerning Assyria because this chapter explains Assyria's role against the house of Israel. And again, we must understand that this prophecy is dual. So we have already seen that in Ezekiel, and so we can expect the future fulfillment. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 5, it says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. Now this is God speaking, brethren, through prophet Isaiah, and God is going to use Assyria to punish his people again. He punished them in the Old Testament, and drove them out of their land, their promised land, and he is going to punish them again and drive them out of their present lands. He used the ancient Assyria to punish his Old Testament people. He'll use modern Assyria to punish his people Israel, those who have lost their sense and the sense about their true identity because, you know, they are rejecting God of Israel today. And one of the godless one of the godless, one of the leading godless societies are actually societies of northern, northwest Europe and the Great Britain, British Commonwealth and the United States of America. Those are people who are today modern descendants of the house of Israel. 
Now in verse 6, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 6, I'll send, God speaking, I'll send him, the Assyrian, you know, the Assyria, the rod of my anger, I'll send him against an ungodly nation, him, you know, the Assyrian. So the coming European dictator will be of the Assyrian or, or of the German brethren origin. And against the people of my wrath, who are the people of his wrath? Well, it's the house of Israel, because the house of Israel, by its sins, keeps provoking the eternal to wrath. I'll give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Verse 7, yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. Now he, in these verses, brethren, is referring to an Assyrian who is soon, to a German, who is soon going to become the head of the United States of Europe. How soon, I don't know, but soon. And the coming European dictator will be of the Assyrian or German origin. Have, make no mistake of that, brethren. No, it's not French. No, it's not Spaniard. No, it's not Italian. It is of German origin. And Dr. Thiel has been following a German political figure for years whom he suspects the post to be possibly that one, that coming European dictator. And we have all read, I think, uh, in his articles about Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg and how Gutenberg's biography seems to fit the descriptions in the prophecies related to the coming European dictator. Now, whether that coming dictator will be Gutenberg himself or someone else, brethren, it remains to be seen. But we are what well, the point is, we are closely watching the events here in Europe, and we are also reading Dr. Thiel's writings on Bible prophecies that explain to us what is currently happening in and what is yet to happen both in Europe and uh, in the world. So we need to keep watch, watch and pray, to be accounted worthy to, worthy to escape all those things that are to happen. Now, God wants to use Assyria to punish his people. God wants to use Germany, brethren, to punish modern-day Israel. But this is not what the Assyrian mean, as we have just read in Isaiah chapter 10. So what does, what does it mean? What is the real thinking of Assyria? What is its real philosophy? He does not mean so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. Not a few meaning many. Well, brethren, this is German philosophy. This is real German thinking. Verse 8, for he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Now, interestingly enough, the word prince here in the Hebrew is sar, S-A-R. And it does occur in a number of places in both the Old and the New Testament because there is a Greek equivalent to that word. And Strong's Concordance defines the word sar as head person of any rank or class, captain that had rule, chief, captain, general, governor, keeper, lord. I'll just mention some verses without reading them where we see the word sar, brethren, in the Bible. Uh, we see that uh, word Sar in the Bible in Numbers chapter 6, 16, verse 13, when Korah said to Moses, you know, you make yourself a prince over us. Now, prince is Sar, S-A-R. Also in Isaiah chapter 9 and in verse 6, talking about Christ, uh, it says that Christ will be prince of peace. Prince is Sar in Hebrew. And in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, talking about a demon, the word in Hebrew is Sar. In the New Testament, we find in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, the Greek equivalent to Sar concerning Satan, the prince of the power of the air. The Greek word for prince here is Archon, which means one first in power, authority or dominion, hence a ruler, lord, prince, chief person. Brethren, Satan is a prince, and prince implies power and grandeur. And again, in verse 8, here in Isaiah chapter 10, when it says, Are not my princes, sar, altogether kings? A king is someone who sits on a throne. So we are beginning to understand the way of thinking of the Germans, of the Assyrians today, and why uh, terms like Herrenvolk, the German for master race, were used in the past. It is a people, brethren, who thinks that they are superior, that they are princes, kings. It is not enough to be princes for the Assyrians, but kings. 
Now we know that the word all together, meaning all of them, the top echelon that we have just read in Isaiah. I've mentioned to you that there is a book in French which is very relevant to what the Bible prophesies about German, about the German mindset. André Brissot, a German historian who studied Germany of the 30s and 40s, wrote a book entitled Hitler and the Black Order. Now the book was written in French, as I said, and it was published in 1977. Now this historian doesn't really fully understand or realize the impact of what he wrote. And I believe that we do realize and understand that impact or that we will realize and understand it after we read some excerpts of his writings. Brissot in his book quotes many philosophers and also many words of Hitler himself. So that is very important for us because he went straight to the origin of all those Aryan and anti-Semitic and uh, supremacy uh, of the white race uh, teachings so we can rely on his research. And again, as I said, what a pity, brethren, that such a book has never been translated into English or other languages. Now, uh, we can easily draw the parallels between his writings, Brissot's writings, and what we know as the members of Church of God. What the Bible says in its prophecies that we can read in that book, because it illustrates the Assyrian philosophy. We also know that in the 40s came the sixth resurrection of the so-called Holy Roman Empire or the sixth resurrection of unified Europe under the Germanic rule. And that was usually the case in the revivals of uh, United Europe or revivals of that Roman Empire, brethren. It was done by the blessings and good service of the Catholic Church, Vatican, and also it was usually done through the uh, civil power of the Germanic rulers. So what we are seeing now happening in Europe, unification of Europe is really uh, again repetition of history and we can see again that those two main components, the religious one and the political one, the military one, brethren, working hand in hand to create another resurrection, probably the strongest of all times, which will be the United States of Europe. That will be nothing more than a resurrection of the ancient holy so-called holy roman empire so we are witnesses today we are witnesses of the seventh and the last resurrection of that empire in europe which means that we are living in the end times and it means that the return of jesus christ to crush that satanic system is at hand now having read now the prophecies about assyria we know that God is going to use Assyria again to punish his modern-day people, lost Israelites who have lost any sense of their identity. We have also seen that God talks about Assyrian thinking. Now this Assyrian thinking was so evident in the 30s and 40s, and we can expect the same Assyrian thinking to emerge on the surface once again in our day and age and to become evident on the world scene. Regarding the fact that Assyrians think of themselves as princes and kings, here is an excerpt from page 113 of that book in French, Hitler and the Black Order. Quote, All that man possesses today in the area of culture is the culture of the Aryan race. It is imperative to come back to the concept of fighting and of blood purity. We come to the very heart of the Nazi, which stands for National Socialist German Workers' Party, to the very heart of the Nazi doctrinal problem, the blood myth, end of the quote. And then he continues in page, on page 114. All crossbreeding benefits lower races. From there comes the decadence of modern humanity. Now, this author, French author, Brissot, mentions Gobino. Gobino is now mentioned in the book. Who was Gobino? Well, you may not have heard of him, but you can find him on the internet. Gobino was a philosopher in the 30s and... Uh, uh, internet says Joseph Arthur Gobino that he lived in the 19th century that he was a French aristocrat who is best known for helping to legitimize racism by the use of scientific racist theory and racial demography and for developing the theory of the Aryan master race. Well brethren Hitler also had a certain philosophy of life as we know but he was not the one who invented this philosophy because he used the philosophy that already existed in Germany. And that is why is this book by André Brissot in French, for those of you who speak French, very valuable. 
because it shows to us what was the influence on Hitler and where did Hitler get his, his philosophy. And Hitler, of course, used that philosophy that was already existing and present in Germany. He used it very powerfully to lead astray the German nation and the German diaspora around Europe. Now, Gobino, we read about Gobino in this French work. It says, put at the top of the racial hierarchy, the Aryan race, of which the Germans are. Gobino influenced Hitler. At the top of the racial hierarchy, there is the northern race, which dominates the Aryan race and must play the role of a catalyst so that the elect race could use all of its all of the planet's resources the Aryan race is no doubt the author of all culture the true representative of all of humankind said hitler our entire industrial science is the work of the nordics meaning the people of the north and mainly the german people all the great composers from beethoven to richard wagner are Aryans, even if they were born in France or Italy. Take away the German Nordics and nothing subsists but the dance of the apes. End of the quote. This is their real thinking. And it is very obvious when we read those quotes. Take away the German Nordics and nothing subsists but the, but the dance of the apes. So really, there are first the Germans and then the apes. Page 117 of Brissot's book, Hitler and the Black Order, quote, From this blood myth comes a racial hierarchy, the race of the lords, being the Aryan Nordics, that of the slaves, the others. End of the quote. Well, hence, brethren, there are two, there are two for them. You know, the superior Aryans and the others, the other are slaves. There we have the German princes and kings. Now Satan, as I said, is the one that influences that philosophy. And now we're going to see how he counterfeits God's plan. Because we know he already does it through a great and big church, which palms off as Christ's church and calls itself a universal, meaning Catholic church. But Satan also does it through the Aryan philosophy, brethren. In Psalm 82, we have a fundamental truth that God reveals to his church. Psalm 82 and verse 6. It says simply and plainly, I said, you are gods. And we know this, brethren. We are gods in making. This is our potential to be gods like God. But let us see Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 and understand what Satan thinks and believes. Because Satan wants to create gods in his image too. Genesis 3 verse 5. For God knows that in the day, that's Satan speaking to Eve, uh, trying to lead her astray and lead her to take the forbidden fruit, to take the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan says, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, this is New King James translation, but the King James Version may drive the point better. It says, For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You shall be as gods, brethren, but really as gods like God is God, or like Satan wants to be God. What Satan said to Eve, it really means in the image of Satan, because when we think of it, men, by rejecting the true God, thinks he is God himself. Just like Satan rebelled against God and thinks and would like to be God. Now, how does this translate in the Aryan philosophy? Page 119 of the French book, quote, From the heroic youth will come the second degree, that of free man, a man who is the measure and the center of the world of man creator of man God. In my burgs, in German it means towns or cities, so in my burgs, this is quote from Hitler, of the order the man God will be the splendid figure of a being who only takes orders from himself. End of the quote. Now that is Satan's thinking, brethren. There is no more room for the true God. Man becomes the highest authority there is. He only takes orders from himself. He cuts himself off from God. Now this is in fact taking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
Now we can see clearly those men god, the princes of the Aryan philosophy, who think of themselves as being superior. Let us go back to Isaiah chapter 10. As I said again, it is a key chapter in understanding Aryan thinking. And this thinking is emerging, brethren, again. What this French historian explains in his book is not known to many people. Only a small number, small number of people know about this because, you know, he spent years and years of research to actually find out where did Hitler get his ideas from. Many people no longer research anything and there are, many of them are not even interested in the history of the Second World War because they think it's a long, uh, it's, a, it's a distant past that is, that's something that has happened a long time ago and it will never happen again. Well, that's why this French work is so valuable, because again, this French historian André Brissot, he actually found out where did Hitler get his ideas from. Now, Hitler got his ideas from these Aryan philosophers, which are today not even known to most people. You see, the real motives are hidden and they are unknown to the people on the street, what those motives are, you know. So... Let's go to Isaiah chapter 10 and let's go to verse 13. For he says, By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Well, this is the Assyrian speaking. But my, by my wisdom, now concerning this wisdom, the French historian André Brissot writes in his book on page 28, quote, by cultivating the racial purity, Lanz, L-A-N-Z, or Z, Lanz, is a German philosopher again. Lanz wanted to awake the gods still living inside the fleshly coffin of men in order to give the Aryan heroes the divine organs of yonder, which would make them omniscient, supremely wise and almighty, as in the beginning at the time of the gods. End of the quote. Brethren, on whose wavelength is this man Lanz? Satan's, of course, because Lanz talks about Satan. He wanted to awaken Satan inside man. And no wonder, for Lanz was an occultist, which means that he was in touch with Satan. And you can find about him on internet. It says Adolf Joseph Lanz. He died in 1954, so that means that he you know, lived through the Nazi era and even the post-Nazi era in Europe. He was an Austrian political and racial theorist and occultist who was a pioneer of Ariosophy. He was a former monk and the founder of the magazine Ostara, in which he published anti-Semitic and folkish folk theories. Now, Ostara, you, uh, you might, have, uh, might have recognized, is actually Oestre, Easter, or goddess Astaroth. Astaroth, Astaroth uh, which is mentioned, of course, in the Bible, Astarte, Astaroth. So here we have an occultist, Lanz, you see, who basically advocates Satan. He talks about Satan. He wants to awa awaken Satan inside man. Let us read the rest of verse 13 in Isaiah chapter 10. By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom for I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. Like a valiant ma man. So, brethren, in the second half of verse 13, we see the military aspect of Assyria. Now, in Brissot's book, page 52, there is something written which is an obvious parallel to the Holy Spirit. Of course, we are talking about Satan's counterfeit of God's plan. So, here is the counterfeit, Satan's counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. Here is the quote. In his philosophical work, Louis Jacot exalted the viril, V-I-R-I-L. Now, what is this virile, brethren? The virile is, here is a quote, the extraordinary energy that man uses only in a small part, the line of our possible divinity, the source of the superman. Anyone discovering the existence of the virile and masters it acquires control of himself at a normally unknown level and can become ruler over others and the world. End of the quote. Well, it is a very obvious Satan's counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, brethren, the virile. And we can put down the inhabitants like a valiant, valiant man. Inhabitants like a valiant man. This is Isaiah chapter 10, verse 
13. Again, on page 121, after having explained why men needed to be surpassed, why men needed to take place of God, we read, quote, For man is the God in becoming. End of the quote. Now, whose idea is this, brethren? Satan teaches this doctrine not only to the church in Rome, but also, you see, to a military power to take the place of God. This is Arian philosophy. Satan counterfeits God's plan in a religious order and in a military system. Let us go to Daniel chapter 11, verse 35. This is a prophecy for our time, and we will see it, and we need to be ready for it. Daniel chapter 11, verse 35. And some of those of understanding shall fall, to refine them, to purify them, and make them white, until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. So it is yet to occur, as we will see. Verse 36 speaks about the king of the north. Now the king of the north, brethren, is exactly the same as the first beast of Revelation 13. Is the coming European dictator. It's exactly the same as that uh, uh, Assyrian mentioned in Isaiah chapter 10. So it's the European, coming European dictator of the German origin. So verse 36 speaks now about the king of the north, because, you know, north, north of the holy or the promised land is Europe. And that first beast is arising out of the great sea. Now out of the great sea in the known, in the known world when the Bible was written was the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, which uh, political and military entity has always been present in the Mediterranean Basin? Well, certainly not Africa or Asia or any other continent or America. It has always been Europe. Europe, which has been traditionally composed of the Western part, West Roman Empire, and Eastern part, Eastern Roman Empire. That wound, that division is now being healed, and they're coming together as one mighty, potent nation, brethren. And they'll be headed by this coming European dictator who is called an Assyrian, who is called the first beast, and who is now called also the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11, in verse 36. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. We have just read that he shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. Well, brethren, there is that vanity and arrogance. Now, concerning that this vanity and arrogance, we read the following in Brissot's book, page 116. Quote, The blood myth must be the strength of the German people, a people superior to all since it is both Aryan and Nordic. Then will the German people, feeling strongly about themselves, both humble and imperial, be able to treat the empirical world not as a partner, but as an adversary to fight with the worst violence. End of the quote. Now those who exalt themselves, brethren, put others down. This is the Aryan philosophy. Verse 37, Daniel 11, verse 37. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall exalt himself above them all. Verse 38, but in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses and a god which his fathers did not know he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Well, brethren, god of fortress, most likely the god of military forces, weapons, etc. Which weapons did they not know and uh, who were his fathers? Well, the fathers of the coming European dictator were the leaders of the other resurrections of the so-called Holy Roman Empire. Hitler was the sixth resurrection of that empire. And weapons used before will be different to those used in the last resurrection of the Roman Empire because chemical and biological warfare did not exist in the 40s, you see. So we see in the Bible, prophecies, that the king of the north, which is the same as the Assyrian in Isaiah chapter 10, is interested in two things, himself and military strength. Now concerning himself, from page 122 of the French book, we learn the following, quote, One does not talk about creating a new superior class. One creates it, and to create it there is only one way, fighting. The selection for the new elite of Führers will come from Mein Kampf, my struggle. Those who support me, Hitler said, are elect because of their support. End of the quote, brethren. Well, brethren, the ideas of Hitler, 
you can rest assured they still remain and will come again on the surface here in Europe very soon. And uh, I'm afraid many people will be taken aback, many people will be taken by surprise. And those ideas will be used again because they're actually Satan's ideas. And the formation of the holy, so-called Holy Roman Empire is nothing else but formation of a satanic entity that will be persecuting true God's people and will be dictating its own will to the rest of the world. People will be taken by surprise, but we shouldn't because we should know this in advance and we'll, should be, we should be spiritually preparing for that time. On page 113 of Brissot's book, it says, quote, Concerning military force, strength is basic to national socialistic ethics. Hitler never hid that fact. Hitler said, The elementary basis for our concept of the world is the fact that on earth and in the universe only strength is the determining. Every goal that man has reached, he owes it to his uniqueness and to his brutality. End of the quote. Daniel 11, chapter, uh, verse, chapter 11, verse 39. Thus, he shall act against the strongest fortress with a foreign god which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Now, the strongest fortress, brethren, right now is the military strength of the United States, which are part of the House of Israel. And in Europe, the strongest fortress when it comes to military might is Great Britain. Dr. Thiel has written articles about this, and he has delivered sermons on the subject, and he also elaborated about this prophecy that the European super dictator will divide the land for gain. So I'm not going to spend more time uh, explaining that. What I'm trying to emphasize to you is that Satan's philosophy is here, for Satan was the one who offered the nations to Christ. In Luke chapter 4, you don't have to turn there, but in verse 5 and 6, as he tempted Christ, he offered to him all the kingdoms of the world that were given to him at this time. Now, of course, we know that his rule is coming to an end, and we know that the beautiful, uh, beautiful holiday, the holiday of the Lord, the holiday which God sanctioned and commanded, Yom Kippur, as it's known in the Jewish world, or the Day of Atonement, as it is known elsewhere, that very holiday depicts the... Uh, final removal of Satan from the ruling position over the earth so that Jesus Christ can of course establish his kingdom at his coming with his saints and that he can usher in the utopia which is popularly called millennium because of the 1000 rule 1000 years rule that is going to happen and it will be restoring the whole earth so let us now go and read prophecies in the book of Habakkuk in chapter 1, we're going to read about three sections from this prophet because it is relevant for the subject that we are talking about. Now here is God speaking through the prophet Habakkuk. Chapter 1, verse 6, 7 and 8. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Brethren, this is description of the coming European army led and com under the command of Germany. No, nothing has happened. I sent you that thesis, 2000 of German character, for you to read and for your reference, brethren, nothing has changed. And the history is going to repeat itself, and we are dealing with dual prophecies, which happened once, were fulfilled already in the past, but are going to, they are going to ful be fulfilled again in our very eyes, in our very time, in our very day and age. And we need to be aware of that. Verse 7, Habakkuk 1. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed for themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. And note this, brethren. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. Now, the German army in the Second World War was exactly as this. And we people in Eastern Europe, we people of Slavic origin, we were regarded by the Nazi Germans as lower race. The Slavic people, Russians and Serbs in particular, were regarded as lower race, just a little bit above the animals. And Hitler's plan for the Slavic people was to basically use them by forced labor to death. 
he did tolerate some of his allies of the Slavic origin, like the Croats and the Slovakians, but he never really trusted them. He just tolerated them because they just sided with him. But his final solution for the Slavic people was to basically exterminate them and use their living space, the place where they live in the East, for expansion of the German nation. For the expansion of the living room, Lebensraum, living room for the German nation, brethren. But this description in Habakkuk chapter 1, this is exactly what the German army, Wehrmacht, was in the Second World War. We have experienced that here in Serbia. And other nations in Europe have experienced, had experienced that in the Second World War. Now this same experience is going to be coming to the Anglo-Saxon world for its mounting sins against their God. So yes, they're coming from afar, afar like eagle that hastens to eat. They're going to take revenge on the Anglo-Saxon world because they were defeated twice in the last century by the Anglo-Saxon world. And in the meantime, so many things have changed in the Anglo-Saxon world, which used to be far more godly than now. And nowadays, for its mounting sins against God, God is going to give them over to the Assyrians, just as he gave their forefathers the ancient ten tribes of Israel, of which both Great Britain and America and Australia and New Zealand are descendants. They'll give them over to Germans. Great Britain, England in particular, is descendant of, of Ephraim. The United States, they're descendants of Manasseh. So, by extension, Australians and New Zealanders are also descendants of Ephraim. Also, the Scottish people are descendants of the Jewish people and the tribe of Simeon. People of Wales have got also great ancestry. Their Welsh people are ancestors of the tribe of Levi. There are proofs for all of this, brethren. And I've been, I've been exposing those proofs in the, Bible, in the uh, Bible studies. And we have several, we'll be having now still several Bible studies talking about each particular tribe today. So we're talking here about the dual prophecies, those that happened once and will happen in our time, but they happened on the modern day Israel. So here's the description of future of the soon coming European army led by the Germans, brethren. In verse 8, notice I said note, verse 8, notice the German domination over that army because eagle they fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. Eagle is the symbol of Germany today. You can Google it out and you can see that eagle is the symbol of Germany today. In verse 16, Habakkuk chapter 1, we also read that they Germans worship their own strength. Therefore, they sacrifice to their net. Remember, we mentioned the fowler's net of Psalm 91 and we mentioned the net which is now being prepared by the Assyrians for the house of Israel, in which in that net they are going to catch all the house of Israel to enslave them. That's exactly what they're planning to do, or will be planning to do one of these days. And certainly when this European dictator comes into power, he'll start you know, planning this net. They sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. André Brissot writes in his book on page 106, The disciplinary solidarism of Prussia was alone capable of protecting the white race against the assaults of inferior classes and colored races. Brethren, there is a lot of racism in this philosophy. I'm continuing to read, I'm uh, in continuation of this. Uh, of this quote it says this preaching was to awake in german the taste for these vast dreams which need for their fulfillment a total collective militarization end of the quote and now brethren what excuse is given for this collective militarization we have just read the protection of the white race it sounds good to the masses it sounds good to the people in very near future, brethren, a good reason will be given to the people for formation of this military, the destruction of evil, and the need to maintain peace around the world. So we'll have a new policeman, no longer there will be American troops, we'll have the European troops led by Germany. Oh, I know that many of you don't believe that, 
but we'll be seeing that with our own eyes. And perhaps then some of you will finally wake up to reality and understand that the Bible, the Word of God, the Word of your God of Israel has prophesied this long ago and that God asks all of you people in Great Britain and America and Northwest Europe to repent of your great sins. And if you don't, he's going to send you as eagle ready to eat. He's going to send you eagle from afar. He's going to send you the European army led by Germany. They're going to occupy all lands. In the case of the Anglo-Saxon world, they'll just drive you out of your lands into captivity. In the case of Northwest Europeans, perhaps they may not drive you out of captivity, but they'll be using you as, their, as a source of cheap labor. And they'll be using you for their own interests, just like Hitler did in the Second World War. He did it with the Scandinavian countries. He did it with the countries of the Benelux. Exactly the same thing is going to happen. And I know many people don't believe that. Many people think this is, this is crazy. Many people think that, can, that is unfathomable in our day and age. But I, re I assure you from what we know from the Bible, brethren and friends, well, I assure you, we are going to be seeing all that with our own eyes. And perhaps some of you, when all that starts to happen, will finally realize that the Bible all the time, all along, has been a veritable, credible book. The very inspired, divine word of God. So, as we have just read, the protection of the white race... There'll be good excuse, you know, destruction of evil. There'll be good excuse for the formation of the, of the European army. And it would, you know, look good to people. And they'll hail the political beast who will be the commander-in-chief of that European army. They'll see a divine hand in all that. And thus they will, as it says in Revelation 13, they'll worship the beast, the first beast. They'll worship the coming European dictator as European's messiah as Europe's Messiah. And that very army, brethren, will guard... I know I have to say this, somebody will say this is perhaps German bashing. No, I'm not bashing any nation. I just have to give you the interpretation of the Bible as it is. And I have to warn you, particularly you people of Northwest Europe and Great Britain and America, that your end is close and near. And it will be very tragic. It will be the greatest national fall of all times, unless you turn around and repent. So I have to tell you that that very army, European army commanded by the Germany, will guard the future concentration camps and death camps where the captured descendants of the modern-day House of Israel will be held along with the lukewarm Christians, Laodiceans. And that may sound ludicrous to you at this time, at this point, but all the concentration camps and all the death camps are there in Europe still. All the gas chambers are there. All that needs to be done is just to reignite them. People cannot fathom that. They think it's unreal, surreal. Well, we'll be, unfortunately, or fortunately, because that will be the signal of the very soon end and the coming of the Messiah and the coming of his messianic age, we are going to be witnesses to that. And soon enough, as I've said so many times, we're going to see with our own eyes the European army in operation, friends and brethren. And that army, as I said, because this is important, those of you who don't believe it, perhaps you might find yourself in that captivity and then you'll wake up because there'll be two witnesses in Jerusalem testifying exactly about this thing as it will be unfolding before our eyes when that future comes. That army will guard the future concentration camps and the future death camps where the captured descendants of the modern-day House of Israel will be held, will be tormented, will be used as cheap labor, and along with the lukewarm Christians, Laodiceans, who will be beheaded, as it says in Revelation 20, for their faith. If they don't recant, and I hope that they will not. Because in the Church of God at large, today we can see the dominance of, unfortunately, the dominance of the Laodicean spirit. Spirit of indifference, the spirit that doesn't want to get educated about things, the spirit that doesn't actually believe... What the Bible says. You may say, how? Well, they don't believe what the Bible says. 
they're so blinded they just have some silly ideas that you know the canon of the bible was uh, formed in the fourth century that the book of enoch and the modern book of enoch Bedouin, by the way is a uh, counterfeit it is a, a gnostic writing it has nothing to do with the ancient book of enoch that what which has been lost a long time ago it has been lost so uh the Laodiceans are so blind about the true bible they don't believe really what christ says he says the great tribulation which will be this captivity of the modern day house of israel the great tribulation will be the greatest horror ever to happen they don't really seem to believe. The Laodiceans don't really believe. Oh, he probably doesn't mean it will be that bad. He probably doesn't mean it will be worse than Hitler and the concentration camps. He, Yes, he means it. God means what he says. And Jesus Christ, God is not a liar. He is not a man. He is perfect, almighty God who has given us his word with all the great blessings prophesied for those who obey him and also all the horrible things prophesied for those who disobey him particularly for his nation israel modern day israel today and many modern day israelites don't even care about their origin or who they are well you may not care about it but you know what people of northwest europe and you in great britain and you in america and australia and new zealand god does care because you're his people you're the ancient Israel, you're the Old Testament Israel. God does care about who you are because you're his people and his eyes are always upon his people. So you may not care about God. You may just dismiss him. He's still there watching over you. And because he has given you so many wonderful blessings which you did not deserve, but you inherited because of the righteousness of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He is now, because you have misused all of those blessings in various ways, he is now going to take them away and he is going to punish you. Until the remnant of you people will repent and turn to the same God who has given you so many blessings. <coughs> and who has given us, through you, Israel, to all of us, to the rest of the world, the greatest blessing, of course, of all, the spiritual blessing, the Messiah. The Messiah, the King of the universe, the King of all the nations, the Messiah, which has redeemed us by his blood from our sins you don't care about that messiah you just use his name the name of jesus christ in vain but you don't care about him anyway the coming european army commanded by germany modern assyria and the german itself or europe united states of europe led by germany will be killing people in the name of god people will be killing god's name john 16 verse 1 and 2 the last prayer of Jesus Christ before, before he was arrested. Verse 1, John 16, verse 1. These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They'll put you out of the synagogues. Yet the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Now here's a quote from page 119 of Brissot's book. Quote, this is Hitler's, Hitler's words. The providence has chosen me. To be the great liberator of humanity. Verse 3. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Now on page 142 of the French book we read the thinking of another philosopher, Rosenberg. In Rosenberg's vocabulary, the mark this brethren, quote, The Luciferian is not satanic. It is the supreme ego that is the Nordic mind. Lucifer belongs not to the realm of fallen angels, but to the realm of nature from which he draws himself back to dominate it by recreating it as a creator god. End of the quote. Well, Brethren Rosenberg greatly influenced the Aryan philosophy, and they, as you can see, they admit being inspired by Satan through this. They think Lucifer is a creator god, and this philosophy is very like a religion it is much like god's plan for his people and what will their religion be brethren second corinthians chapter 11 verse 13 and 14. we're talking about europe europe today and soon coming europe be soon coming europe which will be reshaped by all these Aryan philosophical ideas that will revive 
and come back into, ex into existence. So we're talking about our near future, about reality that I hope at least some of us, if not all of us who are listening to this, might be prepared for. Or if you don't want to be prepared for, or if you dismiss this and think this is all lunacy, well, at least you have heard it for a witness and you cannot say tomorrow that nobody told you right on time before it happened. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, For such are false, we're talking about their religion, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, verse 14, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Well, brethren, Satan and friends, Satan is disguised as an angel of light through the Aryan philosophy. He will try to enforce his way in Europe very soon. And sure enough, he will succeed. And the whole world, as I said, will be stunned. I just hope that we as God's people are not going to be that stunned and that surprised because we have read all, all we're reading about all of that already here in the Bible. On page 166 and 167 of Brissot's book, it says, I'm quoting, the party, Nazi party, shall never cease to be the selection of the political leaders of the German people. It will form a headquarters of apostles and political fighters who will perform their duty as obedient officers, faithful to the movement. Interesting, apostles, brethren, religion. You see how accurate the Bible is in what it has predicted for our times. It will form a headquarters of apostles and political fighters who will perform their duty as obedient officers, faithful to the movement. It will be immutable in its doctrine, hard as steel in its organization, and flexible in its tactics, and as a whole, it will be like a religious order, brethren. So, we see that Hitler's political party was considered as a religious order, while the political and military ideas were considered as doctrines. It's all religion, Satan's religion, brethren. What is the type of government in that? In that religion, in that religious order. Page 169, Brissot, quote, What occurred at the top echelon was felt from the top to the bottom of the pyramid. End of the quote. The pyramid, brethren, is their structure. It is the counterfeit of God's government because God in his own church has a pyramid from the top down. So Satan has a pyramid also. Page 168, quote, The Führer, Führer or Führer was number one, the supreme commander of the army, head of the government, chief of executive power, and supreme judge. End of the quote. Have you noticed, you know, these that these four things here are all counterfeits of Jesus Christ, brethren, because Jesus Christ holds the same positions. Now the beast leader, the first beast, the king of the north, the coming European dictator will have these four posts. And we're going to see it with our own, own eyes. As I said, page 168, quote, He, the Führer, needn't take into consideration any written law or acquired rights. He could, have, he could give sentences that he saw fit and revoke judges as he pleased. Hitler was the object of a truly religious cult and of the quote and that's exactly what the coming european dictator is going to be brethren he'll be worshipped as a religious cult because rebel uh, because not only revelation but also second thessalonians chapter 2 speak about him as the son of perdition as the man of sin speak about him doing great mighty miracles but being inspired by satan himself so therefore brethren he'll be like a religious cult you see what we saw with hitler in the last century is exactly going to be copied and it will be even worse deception worse than ever in this very century and the second beast babylon the catholic church in rome will make as we have read the first beast we read that in revelation will make the first beast be worshipped so, and this took place in the 40s and it will brethren occur again but this time, I think the deception will be much greater. 
much greater because Hitler didn't perform really any miracles, but this coming European dictator, as is, we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, will be performing great and mighty miracles which are inspired by Satan. And by those miracles, he is going to basically seduce millions and millions and millions of Europeans who will worship him as their Messiah. And obviously, he is going to seduce many other people because in Revelation 13, we read that the first beast was worshipped by the world. Now, the coming United States of Europe will be union of the church and state, just like in the Middle Ages. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15. Therefore, Paul says, it is no great thing if his, Satan's, ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Well, yes, what that military beast and political beast is going to do will seem righteous to people of Europe and probably other continents, some other continents. It will seem righteous, but brethren, their end will be according to their works. Their works are all inspired by Satan. And... Uh, before you go to Romans 7 and we read uh, uh, verse 23, I want to remind you that the German Nazi SS, Schulz Staffel or Elite Guard, the German Nazi Elite Guard were considered as major priests. And Satan also has, you know, his priests, his ministers, his apostles, as we have just read in 2 Corinthians 11, but he also has other law. Romans 7 verse 23. Paul says, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Well, brethren, that law operates in all those who would not submit to God's commandments. And Satan also has his commandments, of course, because he counterfeits everything that God is. He palms off as true God. He palms off as the light. But he's total darkness. His commandments, page 115 from the French book on Hitler, Hitler and, and the Black Order. Quote, let the individual plunge to the deepest in himself. He'll be surprised by the revelation of the blood commandments. Look inside yourself and see the blood commandments. End of the quote. So here we see counterfeits of God's divine law. And also there is a gospel in this philosophy, brethren. No wonder that gospel is the legend of Tula. And that legend, which, in many which is many centuries old, predicted the coming of the millennium according to the cycle of this superior unknown, a sort of medium or messiah of the two times born. That was, you know, the legend of Tula. And Hitler was indeed influenced by it, and he was interested in, in, in all of that, and he was deeply involved in all of that. And Hitler said, here is the quote from Hitler, he said, the national socialism is more than a religion. It is the will to create the superman, end of the quote. Well, brethren, it does resemble God's plan. And we should be ready for the terrible times ahead. Because the counterfeit will be so mighty and strong. The delusion will be so great, held by the mighty miracles performed by this coming European uh, dictator, that people will be completely mesmerized by him They'll be obsessed with him and his charisma. They'll worship him as a messiah. They'll worship him as God. Well, people in Europe, well, we can say that for the Serbian nation, as far as the Serbian political leaders are concerned, we can see how the Serbian nation really deeply loves and deeply associates with and deeply identifies with and deeply gets connected to their leaders. They worship them basically as as a divine beings, almost as a divine beings. Well, how much more, and the Serbian political leaders are not performing any miracles whatsoever, but how much more the Europeans will be worshipping and will be connected with and associated with and mesmerized by this leader, the coming European dictator, the first beast, the king of the north, the Assyrian of Isaiah 10, who will be performing false Miracles. There will be true miracles, but false. Why false? Because all, Satan also does miracles. He can also perform miracles, not only God. People forget that. But of course, people don't read the Bible. They have no idea that Satan also has power to perform miracles. And they will not know. And because they will not know, that is why, because they will not know, brethren, they will indeed fall for this coming European dictator. 
they'll fall for him, worship him as divinity. And you know what? We are all going to see that with our own eyes. Many people don't believe what I'm saying, and I'm not saying out of, out, out, out of the figment of my imagination. I'm quoting you the Bible. What I'm saying is, I'm just quoting what is written in the Word of God. And again, we'll be seeing that with all of our eyes. Perhaps then, some may believe, but you know, many, even many of you perhaps who may hear this, will probably not believe it. And you'll still think that, you know, what happens in this world is happening by a chance, is happening by haphazardlessly without any divine intervention and any divine plan. Oh, no, that's not the case. That's not the case because if this sad world is going to live forever, then woe to all of us. This sad world, the system of the world, all of its political system, all of these national, international bickerings and wars and strifes has to come to an end. The world will not be dis destroyed, but this system will be destroyed. When the Messiah, true Messiah comes, Jesus Christ, when he comes back to the earth, he is going to establish God's kingdom and he's going to establish God's system over the earth. So the world is not going to come to an end and be completely destroyed as many false preachers and false prophets are telling you. But the system of this world is going to come to an end. Oh yes, indeed. In Revelation 17, the political Assyria beast turns against the religious beast Babylon and destroys it. We have already mentioned that. But here is a quote from page 120 of the French book. Quote, I suppress the dogma of the buying of men by the suffering and death of a divine savior and suggest a new dogma of a substitution of merits, buying of the individuals by the life and action of the new legislator Führer who comes to ease the masses of the burden of liberty. End of the quote. Well, brethren, the death of a divine savior is the basis of true and false Christianity. And this philosophy, you see, suppresses that and replaces it by an absolute belief in the Führer, who is the precursor of that final beast in Revelation 13, the first beast, the political and military power of United States of Europe. And this is why... The political leaders will put an end to all religions without exceptions, including the Church of God. Political leaders of Europe, of course. It will be. And you people in Europe, if there are any of you in Europe listening to this, mark this. It will be the worst dictatorship ever in the history of humankind. And the Churches of God, who are now overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the Laodicean attitude... Well, the Laodicean churches will be left to the brutality and cruelty of this beast. In my message entitled The Martyr of the Laodicean Churches, I explained the method of execution that will be fashionable in the Great Tribulation. You can hear that, you can hear that uh, message if you wish. Because this is all warning before it happens. So that nobody could say, Oh, nobody told us before it happens. Yes, God is warning us before it happens. God is giving us his warning. He's giving us time to repent and to turn to him if we want to. Now, Andre Brissot, his book again, page 31, quote, this is quote of Hitler. Quote, from Genesis and creation, the chosen people are not the Jews, but the German people. Hitler's words, page 32, quote, The French, the papacy, the Republic of Venice, Roman Rite, the Catholic religion were merely the multiple aspects of one single reality, a gigantic, gigantic secular conspiration against German ethics, against the German way of life and against the German faith. The emperor will neither just purge the German cities from Jewish and Latin corruption, nor just usher in the German Golden Age, he will restore the German supremacy over all of Europe since it fits in God's purpose. By his cruelty, he will fill the nations with terror. End of the quote. Well, brethren, 
After studying German philosophy and the German way of thinking of that era of the 30s and 40s, the French historian Brissot said, here is the quote, very interesting quote, and we know this, that this will happen, brethren. We know it from the Bible. This man didn't know the Bible, but we know the Bible. Brissot's words. The Germans once held the world, the whole world in their hands. They will hold it again with more power than ever. End of the quote. Well, this historian didn't know the Bible prophecy, brethren, but he's right. And thank God for his revelation of these things in his word. And he added, quote, And everything that will stand in the way of this Assyrian philosophy will be destroyed. End of the quote. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. I'll stand my watch and set myself of the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. He speaking, of course, meaning God. And what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And this is, as you know, quoted, of course, in the New Testament. So, brethren, we are to know what God expects of us, and we are to live by faith, and the only way to live, by faith. And we are to know that invasion on Britain and America and Australia and New Zealand is coming from Germany, brethren, and it will enslave those people for their many sins. I am very puzzled, to say the least, by this incredible Western propaganda against Russia. Russia is now being singled out in the Western propaganda as the greatest enemy of the West. Well, that's really funny because, you know, Russians don't care about the West. Russia is a dominant power, or one of the dominant powers, in the Asian bloc, in Western Asia, East Asia, and it's in close alliance with China. Russia is now one of the world's superpowers, yes, indeed. Russia has got its own sovereignty, it's got its own way of life, its own philosophy, its own religion. But Russia has never been interested in conquering other peoples. You know, Russians have never been interested in to cut off nations, not a few. Russians were the ones who counterattacked Germany, Hitler's Germany, and basically helped liberation of Europe. Russians have never attacked the Western countries. It was Hitler with whom Britain and America went to war. It was Hitler who was Hitler and Germany threatening the world peace. And meanwhile, all the eyes are now being fixed on Russia in the Western world. And meanwhile, in the back burner, behind your back of the West, Germany is quietly rising to the level of a world superpower. Germany is quietly rising. The supposed ally, NATO member and ally of American Britain is rising to its heights, the highest heights ever. The last seventh resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire ruled by Germany with the blessings of the Catholic Church. Amazing. It is so amazing how the Western world has lost any sense and compass when it comes to world politics. You have an ally, Germany, lying you to your face that they're your allies when in fact they hate you. And you, Britain and America, are going to pay dear price for allowing Germany to be your ally. And we should know, as I said, that the invasion on Britain and America 
and Australia and New Zealand is coming from Germany. The eagle prophesied in the Bible, the symbol of Germany, will swiftly fly and make desolation of your land and will take all the remaining inhabitants of the land into captivity, into the concentration camps and death camps and labor camps. And what they did to the Jewish people in the Second World War will be exactly done to the Anglo-Saxon people in the 21st century. It may sound as bad news, but well, it is not a bad news. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, I would heal their land, God said. What are Anglo-Saxon people doing? Are they praying to God? Oh no, they just go on their Sunday services once a week and uh, supposedly pray to God, to Sun God. God never sanctions Sunday, the day of the sun, as his day of worship, by the way. They just live in their sins. They just soothe their consciences every Sunday when they go to their churches and come back home feeling much better. And then they continue in their sins, eating unclean foods, unclean meats, committing all sorts of sexual sins, indulging into pornography, adultery, fornication, lying, stealing from God, not giving the tithe, the, the tithe which belongs to God, and so on. The Anglo-Saxon nations are totally turning against God. In the past, even during the Second World War, and when the British king, King George, when he asked the nation to fast, the British nation, the churches were full. And one Sunday was dedicated to fasting, not eating, you know, for the whole day. I just wonder what would happen if the Queen Elizabeth would, <laughs> for whatever problem, for example, COVID-19, if she would ask the British nation to fast for a day. They would probably laugh her heads off. They would probably ridicule her. So as you can see, the moral decline of the Anglo-Saxon nations is tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. That's why God is sending Eagle, Germany, German European army, to conquer those nations and punish them for their sins. And God does it out of love. Because he wants that at least some of you Anglo-Saxon people would repent and turn to him and realize that without him you are absolutely nothing and all the achievements you have got and all the wealth you have got and all the world dominion it's all part of the blessings given to you not because of your merits but because of the merits of your ancestors Abraham Isaac and Jacob because Abraham was a righteous godly man and God promised that his descendants will be ruling the world at least for a while, and he also promised that they'll be inheriting great material wealth. God has fulfilled his promises. He's no longer obligated to Abraham. And now he's going to punish the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for their rebellion against him. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 16, 17, and 18. Habakkuk 3, 16. When I heard, my body trembled. Oh, I just wish that those of you in Anglo-Saxon world and Northwest Europe and elsewhere in Europe in the world, when you listen to this, that you will tremble. Because this sounds to you like a fairy tale, and yet it is not. It is soon coming reality. Can you just imagine how horrible that reality is when the when the prophet Habakkuk trembled as God revealed all that to him? Prophet Daniel couldn't, couldn't sleep, couldn't continue his normal life when he saw the fourth beast. The Roman Empire, which would be revived, you know, which was revived six times already in Europe and is now reviving again. It was so dreadful and horrible, he couldn't sleep. Of all the, because of all the crimes and, 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 and terrible things that that beast was prophesied to do. And all that brutality and stuff, yes, we are we can see it in the Second World War. But that is going to happen again. Because we're reading dual prophecies. 
Some of those prophecies happened in the past and they will happen again in our time. My lips, continues Habakkuk, quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. The day of trouble, the great tribulation, that he might rest. He probably wanted to be dead rather than seeing that great tribulation. Many of you who will fall into that captivity will probably want to wish that you were rather dead. But when once you fall into captivity, no, just be, you know, rather repent. Do not be dead. Repent. Make your spiritual life alive. Life alive, yes. You allow the Sian churches, endure, repent and become zealous. And remember that God said he'll give you a crown of life if you endure to the end. Endure to the end, lose your life, but you'll get the real life. You'll inherit the real life. And you other Israelites who are not believing, you'll be having, as you'll be having there as well as the Laodicean churches, you'll be having the two witnesses in Jerusalem to be strengthening you. And the remnant of you, yes, will survive. That's also prophesied in the Bible. And then you will be returned by God's divine hand to your own promised land. Again, because your promised land is still there waiting for you. Part of the house of Israel, the house of Judah, part of Judah has already returned there. The mighty Jewish state, the state of Israel is there and it's waiting for us, for the rest of us. The Jewish people have, part of the Jewish people have returned so that they'll be preparing the way for the other tribes of Israel to come back to their land. Brethren and friends, God has got a perfect plan, amazing, perfect, simple plan. People just don't believe it, of course, because they've got, they've got their minds chained by the preconceived ideas and chained by the uh, unbiblical theories and ideas of the nominal Christianity. We're in Habakkuk chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, verses 16, 17, and 18. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, and all of this is going to happen to modern-day Israel, Yet, verse 18, Habakkuk says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll joy in the God of my salvation. Well, in spite of all the horror that will fall upon the modern-day Israel, especially on the Anglo-Saxon world, we have the assurance, this confidence of God. Yes, Assyria, modern Assyria, Germany, will be used to punish modern-day house of Israel. But we have this assurance, like Habakkuk had it, not fearing, not trembling, but knowing for sure God will protect us if we humble ourselves before him. We should be preparing spiritually for this time, brethren and friends, when Germany will fulfill these prophecies. Yet we should rejoice, because beyond this suffering there will be God's kingdom.